Thanks again for joining us this evening. I'm going to pose you a question, and it's a question that I want you to think about. If you had to answer it today, what would be your response? And that question is, how do you define maternal? Whether that's in your operation, maybe that's for your customers, what fits inside of how you define maternal? You know, I think if we were to ask several people that question, we might get slightly varying answers to a degree. I think we can all agree that there could be a little bit of variation. However, I also think that we could all find some common ground as far as how we define maternal. And I would say that most people would define it as, it's gonna be a heifer that she breeds early, she calves on time as about a two-year-old, and then she stays productive in the herd. She is a cow, breeds back every year, ideally has a calf that does well. And she does all that without having any issues, right? There's no issues with her feet, with her udder, disposition. You can go down the list. But I think we do have some common ground of how we can define maternal. With that, I wanna ask you another question. And that's, how do you improve maternal? Do you have information available today to be able to use to make maternal selection decisions? With that, is that information available? All right, so we're gonna go through another series of questions and I want you to think about if you were answering these questions, would it be a yes or a no? So first of all, do you have Angus females? I assume if you're watching this webinar, chances are you probably do have Angus females in your herd. Do you keep track of the calves that are born each year? If you're in the registered seed stock business, the answer to that question is yes, because you need the birth dates for those calves. So most of us would have that information for the calves that are born in our herd. On the other hand, what about those females that don't say on schedule, right? Maybe she's open for whatever the reason may be. You know, maybe, maybe you moved her a season because she bred late and you decided to move her from, from the spring herd to the fall herd. Maybe she's a donor female that, you know, it wasn't her fault that she's not still on schedule. You made that management decision to move her into the donor pen. And so now she doesn't have a calf um, on a 365 interval. I'd also ask you, do you know which females in your herd are either cold for whatever reason or that die? This is a lot of the information that can go into building something like a functional longevity trait that we're gonna talk more about this evening. I'd also ask you, are you reporting all of that information through the association's inventory reporting system? And the reason being, the inventory reporting system helps to make sure that every female in your operation gets a record every year. So we're not missing those females that, well, she was a donor cow, she didn't have a calf come in, so why wasn't there a calf? Making sure she gets a reason code accounted for. All of that information helps to fill in um, the records for something like functional longevity. We're really ex excited to announce that Functional Longevity Research EPD um, was released on October 25th. And so that EPD in the research format is out and available. And specifically, um, on the AAA website, there is a list of AI sires that's available for public access that has the list of research EPDs for those sires, as well as the research report that goes through a lot of the details um, that we're gonna cover this evening um, as well. So we're excited to announce that that is out and available. And then for any members that are in inventory reporting, they also received an email that has a list of their females um, alongside the Research Functional Longevity EPD. But before we get into the details about functional longevity, I want to talk a little bit about how did we get to this point to have the opportunity as the association and AGI to release to you as the membership this research EPD. And to talk about that, we really need to go back to the first research that happened on this, um, or at least one of the first times of research, back about a decade ago. So whenever this trait was first looked at, what they found is that we need more complete whole herd reporting data. While we have members that are really, really dedicated to collecting things like birth weight, weaning weights, yearling weights, foot scores, you can go down the list of traits. It was found that for something like a functional longevity trait, we needed more of that complete whole herd data to make sure we had records on females, even if they didn't have a calf. And so from that, the Maternal PLUS program was developed um, and released back in 2012. Since that time, that Maternal PLUS program has been rebranded to inventory reporting. That includes Maternal PLUS as a level of the program, but that really set the foundation to be able to release something like that functional longevity EPD. As we fast forward um, to what was released on October 25th, 
we partnered with, you can see the research partners there at the bottom of the screen, to really work through the data that was here at the association to really look at what data do we have available? What's the best model fit for it? And then how do you start going through um, the data edits and the modeling um, and even the trait definitions and those kind of things? But from that research, there were two peer-reviewed articles um, that were published and they're there on the screen. If you have interest to go and read them, I would encourage you to do so. They're also listed in our research report, um, but they do go through more details about things like random regression um, and using different kinds of data um, in this evaluation. So again, part of the more recent research has really been trying to define that trait. Um, what we landed on is functional longevity, and we'll talk a little bit more about why, but then also the modeling um, that goes behind this trait um, as well. So as we really get into more of the details around this functional longevity trait, I should mention that the name functional is not in the name of this trait without reason, right? There's the opportunity for a female to have longevity in the herd. Maybe she's there for five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years, right? But is she staying functional and productive in the herd? So in the term of functional longevity, we're really looking at cows that not only stay in the herd every year, but they're also producing a calf each year. So the definition behind functional longevity is that on average, we're looking at the number of calves a sire's daughters are predicted to produce by six years of age compared to other sire's daughters. And we'll walk through some more examples of that um, later on, but the data that really goes behind functional longevity are gonna be those calving and culling records, both from the inventory reporting system and the data that comes outside of the inventory reporting system from members um, that have been submitting that for several years. So as we take a, a deeper dive into functional longevity, let's go through a little bit of the data um, that supports this research EPD. So I think the first logical question that, that many ask is that how many records are inside this research functional longevity EPD? And I first should say that we're fortunate to have our partners um, up in Canada. So the data in this particular evaluation is gonna include data from both um, the American Angus Association members as well as the Canadian Angus Association members. We've had them um, as part of our her herd book here um, since about 2000. And so there's a longstanding history of using that data um, in particular evaluations. As far as the number of females included, we're looking at 1.9 million cows that have records in this particular evaluation. Now those 1.9 million cows would comprise about 8.2 million records. And so keeping in mind that a female can have multiple records because she can calve as a two-year-old, a three-year-old, four-year-old, so forth and so on, out to 10, um, females can have multiple records inside the evaluation. In addition, we do also include the genotype population inside of this EPD. Um, and currently that's gonna be at about 1.4 million genotyped animals that are also included in this research. And so that's also gonna calculate out to be about four million animals in the pedigree um, that would have a functional longevity research EPD. So then I think the next logical question to ask is, okay, well, what records are really being used? We mentioned calving and culling records, but what does that mean? So the functional longevity data, like I mentioned, it's gonna leverage that data from inventory reporting, the Maternal PLUS program, as, really as that foundation, foundational data set. I also mentioned that we're leveraging information that comes from outside of that program. So we're gonna be using calving and culling records um, that have been submitted to AHIR since 1990, so that would be before we had um, a whole herd reporting system in place. So we are leveraging data both from inventory reporting and outside of that program. Another key piece of functional longevity is that for a female to start an evaluation, she needs to calve um, as a, approximately a two-year-old female. And then we're gonna use data on those females from ages two to 10. So really a female could have up to nine possible calving events inside of this evaluation. We'll talk more about that in a minute. So the actual phenotype for this particular trait is gonna be the number of calves that a female would have. And then the model that we're using is a random regression model. And I promise we're not gonna get into too many details about random regression, but I do think there's some really key points that as producers and as members, as to why random regression is an important concept to understand as far as functional longevity goes. So we're gonna take a look at an example of what does a female look like um, inside of this evaluation as far as you know, having nine possible calving events. So I have a female up there on the screen, cow one, and we can see that from ages two to 10, she would have had nine calves. You can see the calves listed there in the middle. 
So we can see that she's 10 years of age inside of this evaluation. She has nine records, again, the maximum number of records a female could have, and she had nine calves, so she had a calf every year. If we take a look at another example, we have cow two. And so we can see that she's gonna be three years of age. She did calve as a two-year-old because she got that first calf counted. But then as a three-year-old, um, she didn't have an additional calf added. Maybe in this particular case, she was moved into a donor program. And so from inventory reporting, we know that she got a reason code to say, hey, we made the management decision to move her to the donor pen, so she won't have a calf this year, but we do have that reason code, right? So she's three years of age, she has two records, and of those records, only one of those is gonna be a calf. We move on to cow three. Again, here's another example of a female. She's seven years of age, and we can see that she has six records inside the evaluation, and she has a total of four calves. So again, maybe as a two-year-old, um, she had a calf. A three-year-old, maybe she was used as a recip, and then she was moved back in um, to having a calf um, after that. And then our last final example here of cow four, another example of a female that she was six years of age, she had five records, and she came out um, with three calves in this particular evaluation. But we can see where those reason codes from the program like inventory reporting really helps to fill in for those years that maybe the female was open, maybe we moved her a season or she was a donor, or maybe she had a stillborn calf, and so making sure that we do have a record in place for why there was not a calf. So getting into a little bit deeper dive into functional longevity, the heritability of functional longevity is 0.09. So we're gonna take a look um, at this per particular graph, and you can see on the y-axis we're gonna have our heritability, and on the x-axis we're gonna have our age and years. Right, so I mentioned that a female comes into the evaluation by having a calf at approximately two years of age. You can see there, um, the heritability is gonna be around 0, .0. Um, reason being is that there's not a lot of variation at that point. She has to have a calf in order to get into the evaluation. So there's not variation um, to be able to use for that particular calculation. But what we see over time is that I mentioned that random regression model. And what's unique about that is it actually goes through and predicts a heritability at each one of these time points, right? So we can see what the heritab heritability would be predicted as a three-year-old, four-year-old, out to 10 years of age. And what we see is that, if you remember I mentioned in the definition, we predict functional longevity out to six years of age, right? We can also see here that that's where our heritability is gonna be maximized at 0 0.09. So again, we continue to increase that heritability up to six years of age, and then we start to taper off um, and decrease the heritability after that point. So we know that six years of age um, allows us to maximize the heritability for this particular trait. Now take that a step further, we can also take a look at, so we're predicting a heritability for each one of those time points. There's also gonna be an EPD behind the scenes that's predicted at each one of those ages. So the question then is asked, okay, so if we predict this trait at six years of age, but maybe that female you know, is in the herd till 10 years of age, how good of a prediction are we doing at six years of age to predict her out to seven, eight, nine, 10 years of age? So we can see here in this particular table, we have the ages of females, um, down the, down the left-hand side, and then across the top we have each of those ages, again starting at three years of age, um, moving out to 10. So on the diagonal in bold are gonna be those heritabilities that we just had in the last slide. But we can see here, if we look at the six years of age, we can see that heritability is maximized, um, again at 0 .09. But if you look out to seven, eight, nine, 10 years of age, you can see that the EPDs are highly correlated. Um, to the six years of age. So what that tells us is that predicting at six years of age also does a really good job of predicting out um, a female at seven, eight, nine, ten, And so there would be minimal re-ranking um, by using that, that EPD at six years of age. From here, I'm gonna ask Dr. Andre Garcia to join us um, and to go through a little bit more of the details of functional longevity. Awesome, thank you Esther, and, and thank you for giving us that, that great background about all the research that we've done for functional longevity. And again, we're excited to, to be able to release that research EPD out to the membership. And I wanna start talking a little bit more about why are we predicting this EPD at, at, ages, at six years of age? And, and Esther did a great job in talking about the heritability and the genetic correlations. There are also other considerations that we can make, right? So breaking down that into two different sets of considerations here. So the first, we can look into the beef industry in general. So we can look at, for example, 
the BIF uh, guidelines and their recommendations. And at the same time, we can look into the production system and say, okay, if we look at age six, that's typically the age where those cows, they are breaking even in the herd, which means that they are paying off by producing calves up to that point in their lifetime. And so it makes sense, right, that we need a prediction that will target at least um, at that age in their, in their life stage in the, in the production system. As well as we have pretty specific considerations, or you could say data-driven considerations, which a lot of those would be determined by your data, right, within the American Angus Association database, and how we crunch those numbers to predict that EPD. Those two main factors are the ones that Esther just covered. We, she talked about the heritability and how with the random regression model we can draw the heritability trajectory uh, throughout those ages that we include in that model. So we're considering data from ages 2 through 10 and then the heritability we see is maximized at age 6. So that's a big consideration to determine at what age we're going to predict that EPD because the heritability being maximized, maximized rather, means that that's the point where we're going to have the faster rate of genetic gain by selecting that higher heritability at age 6. The next consideration would be when we talk about the genetic correlation, and Esther already covered those, we can see that from ages 6 through 10, the genetic correlation between those are very, very high. So they are above 0.9, which means if we were to take that model and predict that EPD at age 6, age 7, 8, 9, and 10, then we were to correlate those EPDs, they would also be highly correlated, which means basically that we can treat those as the same trait. So if you predict functional longevity at age six, it's the same trait as if you're predicting at age seven and so on. Uh, additionally, that also means if you were to look at the ranking of the animals at age six versus those other ages, because that correlation is so high, the re-ranking of animals between those ages would be very small. And as we're talking about an EPD, our goal is to rank animals appropriately. And so basically there will be no difference between ranking animals at age six or minimal changes at age six and the later ages. Of course, I do want to make the point that the data, because this random regression model, the data from ages seven through 10 is still very valuable as we think about the accuracy of the EPDs and the amount of information that we have to predict those EPDs. And so, even though we're predicting the, the functional longevity EPDs at six years of age, all that information is being accounted for and it's valuable for those predictions. Now that we have this great background and Esther covers some of the model details and, and the research that we've, done, that we've done to get to this point, we thought let's do a brief overview about the numbers and talk a little bit more about the research functional longevity EPDs. The first set of results here, again, you guys would have seen at this point a list of AI sires with the research EPDs published out there, as well as the data on some of the females inside of inventory reporting. But we thought it would be useful to go over the statistics on the overall population to give us a better understanding on how does uh, the EPD and the accuracy for functional longevity are distributed in the overall population. On this table here, that's what we have. So you can see I have two lines on that table, one for the EPDs, one for the accuracies. Then we'll have the number of animals, the average, the minimum value, the maximum value, and the standard deviation. So let's start with the EPDs. We can look into the number of animals and we see we have about 4 million animals, just short of 4 million animals. That's the total number of animals in the pedigree of that evaluation. Again, that's the overall population, right? So it's a much bigger subset of individuals. As we look into the average of that EPD, we're coming around a 1 or a 1.1. And then as we look into the range of that EPD, or you can think of this as the spread of that EPD in the population, we have a minimum of 0 0.39 and then a maximum of 1.48. As you look into the standard deviation of that EPD, it's a 0 0.08. Now you may think that the standard deviation is relatively small and that's true because with it being a, a relatively new trait and a trait that has such a low heritability, it's expected that the spread of the EPDs initially is not that big. As we move on and talk about the distribution of the accuracies, you can see that our average accuracy is about 0.21. Now, just a reminder that this is a full single step genomic evaluation, so we are using all the genotype uh, all the genotypes that we have available in the database. 
Um, as we look into the distribution of the accuracies, we have a minimum of 0.05 for animals that have a very small amount of information available to calculate those predictions, all the way up to a 0.95. So it's really the whole spectrum there, and it just speaks to you have animals that have different levels of information inside the evaluation. You have, for example, sires that are genotyped and have thousands of progeny with records in the evaluation, so those would be individuals that have very high accuracy, and you have animals that uh, might just rely on parent average and their accuracy therefore is, is relatively small. As we talk about the distribution of the EPDs and the spread, you can see on that table the minimum and the maximum. If you look at the difference between the highest EPD on that population and the lowest EPD, we're looking at about a one. Now, think about the definition of the trait and what's the unit of this trait. Functional longevity is measured, the unit is number of calves, and so that difference is one calf, basically the difference from the highest EPD to the lowest. I just want to preface that, of course, as we get more data into the evaluation and we run more iterations of the research EPD, those thresholds, those numbers can vary a little bit because as we add more data, right, some animals might come out uh, uh, higher EPDs or lower EPDs and so on. But that's the overall distribution of the population that we have right now. As we think about the EPDs and we start looking into the numbers with a little bit more details, there's always a question, okay, how do I use this EPD? How do I interpret the functional longevity EPDs? And so similar to what we do with many other traits, we created a very simple example here so that we can show in practice how we would go about comparing individuals and using the functional longevity uh, research EPD. So here I have a very simplistic example, but I think it's very useful to understand how to do just that. If you look here, I have two sires, sire A and sire B, and our sire A has a functional longevity EPD of a 1.5, and then sire B has a functional longevity EPD of 0.5. Again, as with all traits, when we're using the EPDs, we're looking to compare different sires, and that's what I do when I'm trying to decide, should I select sire A or should I select sire B? So we want to look into the difference between those, those two sires. So in this case, that difference is of one. And how do we interpret that? Well, that tells us that on average, sire A's daughters are expected to produce one more calf by six years of age compared to sire B's daughters. You could also look at those numbers with the EPDs and compare those sires to breed average and see how those sires rank in compared to the breed average. Now, as we think about the breeding objective and the breeding goal for a trait like functional longevity, if my breeding goal is to increase the number of calves that I'm producing, a sire with a higher functional longevity EPD is more desirable uh, compared to a sire with a lower functional longevity EPD. As we look further into those distributions and the statistics of the overall population, it's always helpful to look into different groups of individuals. So this graph here, I'm displaying a list of current sires and their functional longevity EPDs. Now, just a reminder, the current sires are those individuals, right, those sires that have at least one calf registered in the American Angus database uh, within the past couple of years. As we look across this graph, what we're looking at is on the y-axis, we have the number of individuals in that uh, particular population, and then on the x-axis, we have the distribution of the functional longevity research EPD. As you can see on the graph on the curve there, uh, it's a very nicely normally distributed, or you can call it, that's the bell-shaped curve. And you can see on the peak of that distribution, where it's the tallest, we can see that's the average of that particular population, which is very similar to the average of the overall population, just around the one. Again, we talk about the spread of the EPD and how in this case it's relatively small, but even though you can see on that distribution, you have a lot of animals around that average of one, but you still see a distribution along those tails, right, to the positive side or to the negative side compared to the mean. So smaller and bigger than the mean. So there is a distribution of those EPDs, which means there is enough differentiation there to be able to select sires and, and create your breeding objectives based on that functional longevity EPD. Now, let's run through some of the practical anecdotes and as we think about, okay, let's look into these numbers and think about in practice how we're going to use, how do you think about those numbers. Again, we talk about that breeding objective of incre increasing the number of calves that I'm producing in the herd over time. 
If I'm looking at a functional longevity EPD for my selection decisions, I want to select a larger, more positive EPD that's going to be beneficial to that breeding objective compared to a lower uh, and more negative functional longevity EPD. Like with any new trait, and I've mentioned this a couple times already, the spread of that EPD is limited, especially for a trait like this that has a 0.09 heritability. But again, we can still see variation among sires in that population. For this next point, I want to spend a little bit more time. That's a question that we've heard uh, from, from you members and also from our internal team is also, we're also curious about that. And that question is, what is the correlation between functional longevity and the other traits that we predict? Well, we currently don't have those genetic correlations yet. To be able to calculate those correlations, we need to put together functional longevity with other traits in the multiple trait model and estimate those variance components and the genetic correlations. So right now, we just came out with the functional longevity research EPD and we have that model defined, which allows us to come back and do the rest of the research where we're gonna put all the other traits in that model to be able to calculate those genetic correlations. Now, as a proxy for that, we can use the EPDs and calculate the correlations between different traits uh, based on the EPDs, and that can give us a hint or an idea of what the relationship between those traits are. So again, those are not perfect, they serve as a proxy for those genetic correlations, but they give us some ideas. As we look into the correlations between the functional longevity EPD and some of the other EPDs that we have, those correlations are typically low to moderate, so we don't have any very extreme correlations. But again, we are working on the research steps uh, next to be able to calculate those genetic correlations. I think those would be very interesting for us to understand what's the relationship between functional longevity and other traits that we predict. At the same time, understanding those relationships will also be important as we think about how do we model uh, economically, how do we model functional longevity inside dollar M, and that plays a role, right, the relationship between functional longevity and the other traits in that uh, uh, dollar index. And last year on this slide, we know the heritability is low. Now, I don't want you to be discouraged about the heritability. We know the heritability is low, which that, that typically means, okay, the rate of genetic progress is gonna be a little slower. It's gonna require a lot more, more data for us to be able to make progress. But I wanna remind you that when we work with genetics, the advantage that we have on our side is that the genetic progress that we make today is cumulative. So we need to be consistent in our selection decisions. And so over time, as the generations go on, you will see the impact on the population and will improve the population over time. Another thing that that low heritability tells us is that the management and the environment play a big role into a, a trait like functional longevity. I don't think that should come as a surprise, right? Because as we think about reproductive performance and everything that involves a cow having or having or not having a calf in a given season, the management and the environment play a big role into that. As we talk about those management and the environmental components of functional longevity, we, we, we get into this part, which is it's not about the individual cow performance, right? As we think about a trait like functional longevity, a lot of that will depend on the aggregate of information that is coming from different cows from different herds that are sired by different sires. And so once we aggregate that information, it gives us much more uh, power behind those EPDs. So the genetic improvement in this case, right, is not about that individual female record because we know that individual record has a lot of influences from the environment and, and the management decisions. So because those, those cow performance records are, are influenced by the management and the environment, we need aggregates of information across different contemporary groups. Let's say an example, you might look at a cow that stayed in your herd for all the 10 years or even more than that. She has had a calf every single year, so her performance is, is flawless, right? Um, but you need to put that into perspective because that cow has only performed in that particular environment. So one environment, and, and she was managed right in the same way. So one management scheme and one environment. And so although that data, that data point has value for sure, we need to think about a perspective of that individual record versus the whole set of data that we have into that evaluation. And that's what I mean by this last point here is the aggregate of information. Now, 
you might ask, okay, how do you aggregate that information? And that's why we have the pedigrees and the genotypes in the evaluation, because those relationships um, will help us connect those, those data points and predict the animals better. So that's how we aggregate the information, is through the pedigrees and the genotypes in the evaluation. Now, as we were looking into this, these results and, and as we prepared the research EPDs after the research stage, right, one of the things that we wanted to do is, okay, is there a way for us to validate these predictions? As we look into these EPDs, that's the first time we're predicting this trait. So how can we make sense of it and how can we validate it a little bit? So what we did is we came up with an example where we split the population into the percentile. So we did percentile breakdowns uh, for different sires. And this is a small, relatively small group of the population. So this example we did on sires that were born before 2010 and that had at least 10 daughters with records in the evaluation. You can see on the column in the middle with the number of animals, that's a relatively, number, small, a relatively small number of sires. And you might ask, why such a small number if you have over 4 million animals in that evaluation? The reason for this is that we wanted to make sure that we had enough sires with at least 10 daughters in the evaluation with records. Because otherwise, if you take young animals, you run the risk of comparing different individuals that some may have had the opportunity to have daughters perform and some have not, which makes it for an unfair comparison. So let's run through this table here a little bit. So again, we did the percentile breakdown. So you can see the top 1% and the bottom 1%. Again, we're contrasting those two groups, right? The very opposite sides of the scale. And then we did more relaxed selection criteria. If you think about the top 1%, when I separate those two groups, the top and the bottom, it's a very strict, right? I'm only separating the, the, the top 1% and the bottom 1%. As we go to the breakdowns of 5%, 10%, and 20%, it is as if I'm relaxing my selection criteria and I'm allowing more animals to enter that group. So as you can see the number of animals at the top 1% and the bottom 1% has a relatively small number of sires in that comparison. And then as you go down to the top 20%, we have relatively bigger number of sires. So what we did, we separated those sires and we said, okay, if we look across those, if I separate only the top 1% from the bottom 1% and the top 20% versus the bottom 20%, there should be a difference on average on how many calves their daughters are having in the population. So the percentile rankings, right, tells us about the ranking of those individuals based on the functional longevity EPD. And we should have that reflected somewhat in the expression of the phenotype, which is the number of calves. So if you look on the last column, here we have the difference in number of calves. If you look into the top 1% versus the bottom 1%, on average they had 1.3 more calves. As you go down that list, you can see that that difference gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and on the top 20% breakdown, we have a 0.7 difference. Now, there's still a difference, which is if we're ranking the animals appropriately, we want to see that difference appears, right? If I select the top 20% versus the bottom 20%. But our whole point here was to see that decrease from the 1% to the top 20% because that tells us we're ranking the animals appropriately. Now, I want to caution here as we interpret the data on this table because we're looking into the difference of the number of calves, which is the phenotypes. So we're looking into the difference on average on the phenotypic data. And as always, when we look into the phenotypes, we need to be careful about heritability because that difference in phenotypes could be affected both by genetics, and that's what we're trying to track here, but it's also affected by the environment and the management. So we need to interpret this table again with a little bit of caution, but we thought this was a good example for us to understand and, and, and visualize that we are ranking the animals appropriately with the research uh, functional longevity EPD. Now with that, I want to invite uh, Esther back to the stage and we're going to have some, some Q&A back and forth here, Esther. You bet. Andre, you did a great job going through quite a bit of that. I did notice one thing that I thought was interesting that you said is yeah. that one of the common questions we get is around Okay, well, what are the gen genetic correlations mm -hmm. between something like functional longevity and other, other maternal traits that we have, right? Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that that research still has to be done. But as we move forward and we think about functional longevity um, as a standalone trait, 
is it going to include things like claw and angle and mature weight or not? Yeah, and that's a great question, Esther. And, and as it is right now, that's modeled as a single trait model, right? Which means the only trait in there is the functional longevity. As we go forward and we investigate the genetic correlations with other traits, if it comes to a point where we understand those genetic correlations and it, and it seems beneficial to incorporate other traits into that model, we could sure explore that, that possibility. Now, even if we don't include other traits in that model, the way we can take into account the other traits, right, is through the indexes. So once we model functional longevity in, in the dollar M, for example, we'll take into account those relationships among the multiple traits for, for the selection. Yeah. Gotcha, so that makes sense. So, so functional longevity is kind of one piece of the maternal. Right, exactly, okay. yeah, it will play in that, right? And it, that's why it's important for us to understand the relationship between the traits. Yeah. And so Esther, you also did a, a great job in the beginning of describing the data and going through the research. But one of the questions that we get asked is, okay, there are many different scenarios. Is one of those is, okay, my cow had a twin, mm -hmm. right? And so now thinking about the functional longevity, I'm counting the number of calves. How do twins get accounted for in that evaluation? Yeah, that's, that's a good question, Andre. So we do think about the functional longevity being we're looking at those opportunities for the calving event, right? Calving event, not necessarily meaning she had a calf, um, but she had the opportunity, say, once a year to have a calf, right? And so the twins, well, she does have two calves. Um, that's only one calving event, and so she's not going to get counted for two calves in one year. Um, it would only be counted as a single calf. Yeah. Yeah, so Andre, kind of along those same lines, and you know, we're going to talk a little bit more about inventory reporting, mm -hmm. but one of the most common questions that we get, and it's a very fair question, is yep. what about these donor females that don't have an opportunity to have a calf? What do we do with those? Yeah, Esther, that's a great question, and you alluded to the, the inventory reporting and every opportunity that we get, we talk about inventory reporting, right? Because, of course, in this case, for a donor female, she might not have had a calf in that season, right? But it's not because she failed. It was not necessarily a fertility issue. She wasn't open. It's because she was moved by a management decision into a donor program. And so for that case, right, it's particularly important that you tell us why she didn't have a calf. And the way to do this would be through inventory reporting. So that way we know, and then we can take that into account as we prepare the data for that functional longevity evaluation. Absolutely, it's really yeah. hard to account for things that, that we don't know in your records. Exactly, yeah, yeah that's exactly right. Um, Esther, and we, we've talked from you know all the research that was done and then coming up with the data, setting up the evaluation. Now, we know the research EPD is already released at this point that we're mm -hmm. recording this webinar. How do members get access, how they can see those numbers? Yeah, so today available on um, angus.org, there'd be a list of those AI sires um, available for anybody to access alongside that research report that mm -hmm. will go through a lot of what we talked about um, in this webinar as, long, as well as a few other details. Um, but if members are interested in seeing those numbers on their females in their herd, um, in order to do that, we need to be in inventory reporting to make sure that we're getting every female accounted for. Because again, we go back to that early research of this trait, that whole herd reporting data is really what's allowed us to get mm -hmm. to this opportunity to have this research EPD. Um, and so we're, we're giving the first look at the research EPD to those inside of the whole herd reporting system. Yeah, that's awesome. And that's why inventory reporting is so important at this point. Now, I have one last question for you here before we, we, we wrap up this part. But as we think about functional longevity, and we alluded to the modeling of functional longevity into the dollar M values or, or the dollar maternal index value. so. Will functional longevity actually be modeling there, and, and how do you see that playing? Yeah, so Andre, that's a great question. For that, I think we ought to just go ahead and take a look um, and look at our path forward. So as we think about what comes next for something like functional longevity, we're looking at, you know, it's going to stay in this research environment for the next few months, right? Next several months, continue to gain feedback from members about the functional longevity research EBD, as well as continue on with the research for things like those genetic correlations to better understand the modeling inside of something um, like our dollar M, that maternal wean calf value. Um, and then subsequently, that will also be going into dollar C um, if it's included in dollar M. And so again, as we start more of this research to understand those genetic correlations, that's going to be part of the process for understanding how it would look inside of something um, like our dollar M trait. 
Another thing that we're very excited to talk about um, is that we're also planning to host some regional meetings in order to solicit feedback um, from you as members to get more information and more insight um, for things like functional longevity. Um, it's gonna be you know, a new research EPD out there. Let's get the feedback from the membership. And then also, how is that gonna be looking inside a dollar in? So excited for that moving forward. But as we wrap up, I can't stress enough as to how important the complete data recording really is. We think about it um, not only of when she had a calf, that's the really easy information, the low hanging fruit that members are really good at recording. But it's also just as important to know when she didn't have a calf, what was the reason for that? You know, was she a donor? Was she used as a recip? Maybe she was moved to season or maybe she's multi-owned and she's in the possession of somebody else so you couldn't record that calf, right? As well as when did she leave the herd with those disposal codes and what was the reason for it? The other really key piece is we look down the road, what are gonna be the other opportunities that, that data such as this complete whole herd reporting data can provide? So as we look for future tools, um, other research, again, this data helps um, to enable that down the road. So then we also get the question of, well, what can we do today? I'll tell you the best thing to do today is to get involved in inventory reporting if you're not. This enrollment period opened up on November 1 and it goes through July, July, through January 15th. So from November 1st to January 15th, if you're a primarily spring calving operation and you're not involved, I'd tell you take a pretty hard look at it. Um, there's a lot of good information to come. It's not terribly hard. You have most of the information already. And so it's just making sure that once a year, you're making sure that every female has a record and is accounted for. So with that, if you are already involved in inventory reporting, this would be a reminder that if you are a primarily spring calving operation, now would be the time to complete that re-enrollment to stay involved in the program and potentially earn that maternal plus designation on your lookup. With that, Andre and I really appreciate your attendance this evening and we look forward to answering your questions that you might have. We have had some great questions submitted this evening and we're gonna try to do our best to get through all of those before our time is up. You can continue to ask questions throughout the question and answer session. And if you ask a question that we don't get answered this evening, we'll get back with you um, on those through email correspondence. So Andre, our first question this evening um, is really around, as we're in the research phase right now for this EPD, what's the steps for it to become a production EPD? Um, and do we have a timeline for that? I know we touched on it a little bit. Do you, do you wanna talk about that? Yeah, and that's a great question, uh, Esther. As far as the steps, right, I think now, of course, once we put out a research EPD, that means we're confident enough in the model and the data edits that we currently have in place, right? So that's the reason behind publishing that research EPD initially. But especially as we get more data through inventory reporting, right, the, the, the current period that we are right now, we can keep running that genetic evaluation on the background and, and really that's what we do, right? We run it and then we poke it around. We look into different things, look into different uh, pieces of the data. And so the steps are really these, right? In this period where it's a state in the research phase, it's time for us to look into the EPDs and get feedback from, from people that are looking at those numbers right outside of the office. And then, okay, with that feedback, let's go dive into the data and, and you know, figure things out and understand it a little bit better. It's always, it's always helpful to have that outside perspective, right? That gives us some more questions to go um, and, and figure it out. Um, as far as a timeline, right? I don't think we have a, a, hard, a hard deadline for that one, right? I think um, with it being in the research mode right now and, and us getting feedback from the membership and, and, and poking it around in different ways and investigating those results, I think we'll become more confident and start establishing some of those timelines to publish in the in the full production mode. Yeah. Yeah, and I, th I think Andre make a really good point. Part of, you know, the a lot of the value of a research EPD comes from this time where it does sit in research, right? And people have the yeah. opportunity to evaluate it um, and provide that feedback before it goes to production. So we're all very excited for the EPD, but this research time is very important for it. Exactly. Um, so with that, as we look look down the road, how will functional longevity EPD change over time as there gets to be more data inside of that inventory reporting program? Yeah, so of course, right, with any trait, the more data that we add into any genetic evaluation, right, the the you, you get more accuracy behind those EPDs, right, individually, but uh, to, to those individual animals or sires, but also the model itself, uh, right, and also I think I 
for, for this particular one with the inventory reporting data, right? That's really the gold standard data for a trade like this, right? Where we have the complete data reporting. And so that data is very valuable. Now, I'd be curious to see as we accumulate more of that data over time, if you increase the variability, right? Because now you have more complete data into the genetic evaluation. So you could see maybe the spread of the EPDs get a little bit uh, larger or maybe the heritability changes a little bit. Of course, the heritability is not going to go from where it is today to a 0.3 or a 0.4, right? But as you get more variability into the data, into the data that could be uh, beneficial. Yeah, the, I would agree with that. We have a two-part question here. So I'll take the first part if you want to handle the second part here. Okay. Um, so the first part is, is this research EPD genomically enhanced? And then the second part of this is what genetic markers are currently being used in the evaluation? Mm -hmm. So the first part of that, um, back towards the start of the presentation, we talked about the 1.4 million genotypes that are being used um, in this research EPD. So yes, the research EPD does have genomics behind it. And I'll let Andre talk a little bit more about um, the genetic markers. Yeah. And so really uh, for functional longevity, but with any other new trait that we set up, right, like you mentioned, we use all the genotypes that are available for, for the evaluations. And so we use those genotyped animals across the different traits and the different models. As far as the set of markers, right, so the markers that we use for functional longevity are the same markers that we use for, for those other traits, right? So uh, we use the same panel across the traits and and basically across all the genotyped animals to include all the genotyped infor or all the genomic information right into the functional longevity evaluation. Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. So the next question, and Andre, I'm happy to take this one. So it says, will you provide EPD percentile ranks for the research EPDs? And for those members that would have received the research EPDs, specifically on the females in their herd, um, as well as that that list of AI sires that's available. We don't provide percentile ranks for research EPDs. And the reason for that is as we talk about this research EPD, we talk about it as an overall population average. So the average of that EPD was 1.01, um, and then we have our min and our max. But we don't break that out into kind of those subpopulations of our current sires, current dams, and then various non-parents. Um, as we leave it in research, we leave it there um, just with a breed average, and we have our spread, but we don't add those percentile ranks until it's actually gonna be in the production phase. So the next question here, Andre, is will functional longevity longevity be incorporated into dollar M? How will the economic weights or that modeling be determined? Um, I know we talked a little bit about that, but that's probably one of the most common questions that we get. So mm -hmm. let's let's touch on that one a little bit more. Um, as far as functional longevity being incorporated in dollar M, the answer is that's the plan. Um, it's got to go through its research phase, be released into production before we would see it inside of that dollar M value, subsequently inside a dollar C. Um, so the plan is to incorporate functional longevity. But do you want to talk a little bit about that economic modeling? Yeah, and that's and that's through the research phase right now, right? As we as we look into that, typically, right, to determine the the modeling of those traits, right, the economic modeling, we take into consideration, of course you know, the distribution of the EPDs, the heritability of the trait, the genetic correlation and the relationship, you know, of that new trait, in this case, functional longevity with the other traits that are modeled in the index, as well as the economic assumptions, right? You guys all know we use economic assumptions across all the all the indexes uh, through those modelings. And so basically, once we put all those components together, right, then, then we use the statistical model to be able to come up with the economic weightings and then kind of recompose dollar uh, $M incorporating functional longevity into it. Yeah, that makes sense. So there's a question here around, we mentioned those research EPDs um, for the AI sires and where is that information available? So the list of AI sires would be available to anyone on angus.org. Right now, you can find it if you just type in angus.org um, into your browser. It'll be right there on the home page under a functional longevity news and announcement. Um, there's a link that you can look right there at that list of research um, EPDs for AI sires. So there's another question here, and Andre, I'll, I'll send this one to you. So it says okay. the, the calving event um, is used, right? Not, not necessarily weaning. We're looking at that calving event. So if she mm -hmm. has a live calf at birth and then the calf dies pre-weaning, does she have a positive calving event, even though the calf died ahead of weaning? Right. That's an interesting one, right? So because of the definition of the traits, right, is, is the number of calves that, that she had, right? That would that was based on being based on the calving events. 
she would have a, 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 a calf counted there, right? We're not taking into account if she weaned the calf, right? Or we're not factoring mortality between, you know, the 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 uh, calving season to the weaning season, right? And so for that particular one, she will she will it will count as a calf, right? And even though that calf might have died until the weaning phase, yeah. So that may be a good point of adding, you know, inside that inventory reporting program and making sure every female gets a calving record. Oftentimes those calves that that die shortly after birth that aren't there at weaning, they're the easy ones to miss. And so making sure inside that inventory reporting program, every female's getting accounted for, even if she didn't have a calf that maybe made it to weaning. Yeah. And Esther, if I can add a point there too, I mean, uh, that's that. That's when we talk about this, right? Maybe you are getting at a different trait, right? And and if there's interest, that's another point. Well, we we need to collect that data to understand, right? Maybe in the future, once you have the data, you could investigate what's the relationship between having a calf and weaning a calf, right? So what's what's the mortality loss and all those things. And so as we have more data, and maybe that's data coming through inventory reporting in the future you can start defining new, different traits and new traits to add to the toolbox as well. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Andre, I'll send this one over to you as well. Um, so how is the environment and management being modeled inside of the functional longevity evaluation? How yeah. do we account for that information? Yep, good one. So there's so the short answer is through the contemporary group, right? As we typically do for, for our traits, right? We combine uh, a lot of information from management and and, and location, if you will, right, or or those kind of things into the contemporary groups to form the contemporary groups, and that's no different for functional longevity. So we take that that into consideration. And I say this is the short answer, right? The longer answer is because within the random regression model, right, uh, we also model that uh, within the random regression coefficients as well inside of that model. So the random regression is a little bit more of a complex model compared to, to other linear models that we run, for example, for growth. But the way we account for the management and the environmental effects is the same, right? It's through the contemporary group. Yeah, so that would be similar to other traits that we have where that contemporary group is really important as we build that, that genetic evaluation for these traits. Yes, for sure. We really need, we really uh, rely on the contemporary group, right, to be able to account for those uh, management and environmental differences, for sure. Yeah. Um, one other question here, Andre. So this is um, a question that, that I've gotten asked a couple of times, but I'd be interested in your take on it. So we we talked about early on with the trait development of functional longevity, how we landed on for the association, we were going to go with functional longevity. How is this different or why did we go that route instead of like a traditional stability model or some of those other measures that are out there and available? Yeah. And that's a very good question. And I think on the research side, even I think even before, right, you mentioned research that that went on here at AGI before I joined even right through uh, modeling a trait like this. There's, there's many different considerations on how to define the phenotype, right? Some of those are data dependent. So as you look into the data, what makes the most sense, right? So what data is available and how can we define the trait such that we take the advantage of the data the most? Um, and then also, and, and then you get into models like, for example, with the functional longevity, with stability, there's uh, other different types of statistical models that you can use. Um, and then there are also some on the technical side, right, some considerations because those different models, right, they will have different statistical properties and how you run the genetic evaluation and how long it takes to run a genetic evaluation. Again, you mentioned in the presentation where the random regression model allows us to plot that trajectory of the heritability and draw genetic correlations across the ages. And so there are several factors, right, that come into play both from a statistical perspective and from the data side, right? What data is available and, and, and what makes the most sense. Um, if I would add one more point here too, is that whenever we model a trait, we're also thinking about the breeders and, and how to interpret that EPD, right? All right, our, our goal is to make as easy as possible, right? For people who are actually using the numbers to make them as easy as possible to use, right? And so, Maybe we can come up with a very complex trait definition, but then the numbers are very hard to interpret. They're very hard to use. That That's also factored in kind of uh, when, when, when we define, of course, functional longevity in this case, but even any other trait, right? Those are some of the things that comes to mind that we need to take into consideration. 
Yeah, those are those are all really good points. There's a lot that goes into it before we get to the final release of re research EPD. Yeah, and I think an important point here too, Kelly is oh sorry Esther, uh, I'm seeing Kelly on my on my screen here. Um, an important point there is. Yes, there might be slightly different trait definitions, right? And they might be co correlated to some degree. But I think when we think about the selection, right, the breeding objective and the selection goal is really important, right? So for a trait like functional longevity, you want to select, you know, uh, cows or, or you want to select bulls that will produce daughters that stay in a herd and produce a calf every year for a longer period of time. And so even if you define the trait slightly different, your selection objective is still the same, right? You want to improve female performance and have females that are more efficient to, for the future generation. So I think it's always important to keep the selection goal and the breeding objective uh, in our minds too. Yeah, absolutely. And Andre, I know we're really excited about this research EPD to be out. We're very excited about the feedback that we're going to get over the next several months um, for this particular trait. Um, but this evening, that's all the time we have for questions. So on behalf of the staff here at the American Angus Association, we'd like to thank you for joining our webinar this evening. The next Angus University educational event will be held in person on Friday, January 5th at 10 a.m. on the Oklahoma City Fairgrounds at Cattlemen's Congress. The topic will be balancing the consumer and the cow. A recording of this session will air later in January if you're not able to attend in Oklahoma City. You'll receive an Angus University email update if you're signed up for those, and you'll be notified with additional details, and we hope you join us again. After we finish, your browser, your browser will be redirected to a survey. We value the feedback you'll provide about this webinar and suggestions for future educational topics. Additionally, a full recording of this webinar will be available on Angus University, the Angus TV YouTube channel, and also sent to you via email. Once again, thank you for joining us this evening and have a good night.